Hey everyone, welcome back. This is uh, Inclusive Design 24, 2022. Thank you for joining us. Also a big thank you to our platinum sponsors, Fable and Intopia, and to our gold sponsors, Barrier Break, TPGI, and UX for the win. Uh, if you use Twitter, you can find us there at ID24Conf, and the hashtag that we'll be using for this conference is hashtag ID24, if you'd like to join in on the conversation. Um, speaking of conversations, while you're watching this on YouTube, you can also participate in the, in the chat. So feel free to throw in questions, comments, accolades, uh, you know, compliments, all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, with all that said, I'm now going to hand it over to my co-host, Mark. So uh, take it away. Yeah. Hello also from my end, uh, over here from Germany, all in the morning. Uh, first of all, I'm totally delighted to be a guest host at ID24. Uh, great show again. I mean, 10 hours in already. And it's uh, great that you are um, all setting this up. So thanks a lot. And now I'm absolutely happy to uh, welcome our next speakers. Yes, speakers. That means we have more than one. And uh, uh, the next two speakers are uh, Matt Ater and um, Rochelle uh, Bradley Montgomery. And well, to not be in your way as you want to see their talk, which is called Tips and Trade-offs to Designing Accessible uh, Escape Rooms, um, I pass over to you, Rachel and Matt. Have fun, enjoy everybody, and uh, see you after the talk. Thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Rochelle. I am executive director for Accessible Community, and I am one of the designers of the Accessible Escape Room that tours to different places. And Matt, you are muted. It's always fun to do that. Uh, this is Matt Ader, and I'm the vice president at Vispero, and I am um, also one of the designers of the Accessible Escape Room, and lovely to be here, and good morning, Rochelle. And as Mark kindly said, we'll be talking today about tips and trade-offs and basically things that we've learned while designing the accessible escape room for the last two years. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to start by introducing an escape room because even though they have grown in popularity, not everybody knows what they are or they have a slightly different thought about them. Um, we're going to talk about the two different approaches to designing them. Um, talk about some of the trade-offs between be doing in-person versus virtual, because due to COVID, we've had a chance to do both. Um, and then we're going to walk through an example, uh, as well as talk about some additional considerations. Again, things we've learned that we have to think about that we, even as accessibility professionals, didn't think about the first time through. And then we will answer any questions. On the side of this particular slide is a picture of what some people think of as an escape room. So there's a clock at the top. So you've got this kind of pressury time limit, which we do have a time limit. Um, but then tied to it is like there's a there's a rack of different handcuffs hanging on the wall. And and that's what people often think of. And so we've heard uh, people say what you don't lock people in. And as soon as they do, they're like, oh, my whole body relaxed when I heard that. And we don't an escape room. Moving to our next slide, is it a themed team building activity um, to where you get to solve puzzles to achieve a goal? Uh, some escape rooms do lock you in, but ours don't. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about that. And Rochelle, I think that's one of the, the key things around escape rooms that people do fear the most is, is being locked in. The, ex the anxiety kicks in. And I think when you if you for some reason do go to one that you know it, it it appears that they lock you in ask them straight up and you know be uh, honest with any level of anxiety that you have and in most cases they don't really lock you in and there's ways to open the door and just walk right out yeah that's so true um but even that perceived or that perception of um, being locked in or being trapped really causes people anxiety. And, and one of the things we've talked about a lot and do talk about when we're getting into themes is uh, the fact that in a lot of escape rooms, traditional escape rooms, the more advanced escape rooms do have this perception of trapping you, even though they don't really. 
and um, the ones that are more kind of fun themed or light themed are often also easier because they're geared for kids. And so I think one of the things that we try to talk about when we do talk to escape rooms is about just the fact that, you know, have some themes that are lighter and fun, but still for adults are still a little bit more challenging. Um, and we try to do that. We try to pick fun themes that aren't going to raise anxiety uh, and at the same time um, make puzzles that are as challenging as, we, challenging as we can make within the time we have to provide the escape room. I would say that, that? that yeah. with theme, well, with themes, it's it's interesting because it's one of the most challenging parts of getting started. It's almost like you're sitting back saying, "How do I, how do I start this process?" And you have no idea which theme you, you know, how do you pick a theme? And I remember the couple times when we did this, it's it's you sit back and say, "Where do we start?" And some of those themes can be really scary, and some others, like when I first went with my daughter, you know, things like a. Um, uh, uh, pirate themed one may seem that way, but there's no pirates in the actual escape room. It's just <laughs> actual puzzles that seem like you're on a pirate ship. Um, and we've seen others that seem way more intense and, and anxiety driven things like an airplane level theme. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's something that we had to do when we started going around and looking at opportunities to do this we had to look around at themes to just get ideas, not that you want to copy themes, but you want to start your brain thinking of, of a theme that can help um, get the, the, the juices moving, as they call it, you know, to, to get yourself thinking about, like, what if I did a theme like this, what would the puzzles be without looking at the puzzles they did, just to help you um, think in the mind of puzzles, which is mm -hmm. where a lot of folks struggle when designing, I think. And that actually transitions us really well to slide four. Um, there are two real design approaches, and I think we've used both. One is top down, and I, that's become our preferred design approach to, to doing escape rooms. And that's to come up with themes. We generate and brainstorm themes and then pick one, move to possible elements, like different ideas. And we're going to walk you through an example of this. Uh, then pick puzzles based on that, and then really think about the accessibility and accommodations and what can we do. The way we did our first escape room was a little bit more bottom up. We knew we wanted to teach certain things about accessibility and accommodations, so we were kind of fitting the puzzles into what we wanted to teach and then going up from there to how would they fit into some kind of element or theme. And so we were going the opposite direction, but I think um, doing the top down approach has been been more successful. Yeah, and I would agree with that. The 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 first one was was nice because in we intended to teach accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, we went after doing the, the um, top down, we actually knew how to apply accessibility to the puzzles and then could talk about them afterwards. And in each case, we, we ultimately want to be able to not only solve the accessibility, but also be able to explain it to somebody in terms of how we got there. And the the bottoms up in the first one, I think, was was the right approach because, again, it was our first time doing it. And hey, let's find some puzzles that work and then apply them to a theme later. And then, and and that was, um, I think, the theme was more um, uh, could have been changed along mm -hmm. the way in the first one, whereas our our second one, being top down, there was a theme straight up, so the theme couldn't be changed, and the puzzles then had to fit. A great point. So kind of moving on to in-person um, versus virtual, because we've had a chance to do both of these now. There's different considerations that we have to do for each of these. So in-person um, has the challenges of having to think about the physical layout of the room. And, and for us in particular, I think in a traditional escape room, you build the, build the um, escape room into a physical space, but we move from conference to conference. So we have to be able to set it up to to use whatever room we've got. Um, we have to think about height and reach requirements along with that, which means making sure we're getting tables and, and things that we can uh, ensure people can reach and get to um, regardless of whether they use a wheelchair or, or um, have some other uh, challenge that would make that difficult. We also have to harden things and that's true in escape rooms too. It's a little harder when we're traveling, <laughs> I think. Um, and then we also have to that's think about- been a struggle. That's stuff. been a struggle yeah. for us. That's really been a struggle. People want to, you know, look, pick up the TV and look behind it in the hotel room 
grab the <laughs> yep. remote and think that's part of it, grab the telephone and it's part of it, the sink, whatever's in the room, they think it's all part of it. And, you know, that, that makes it challenging when you want to um, do it versus, say, a conference room that may be bland but not as exciting from a theme perspective. And I think it's been um, – we've not been able to carry because of being traveling we've not been able to carry all the things with us to make it you know if you went to a um, traditional escape room in a, a place that's done that way uh, permanently they can put stuff all over the walls and things like that that we just don't get to carry with us um in terms of the virtual versus you know you mentioned height and reach i, mm -hmm. I think a good example is you know we in the virtual escape room, we were able to put like a sock underneath the table. And, you know, anybody who looked underneath the table by clicking or, or pressing enter under the ta to explore underneath the table could view the sock. But in the case of a, a real one, we weren't able to do that. We, in the, the, when we first did this at CSUN in person, people wanted to stand on the table and look inside the light fixture. And we're sitting there going, well, you couldn't do that if you were in a wheelchair. So we're not allowing you to do that now. And first of all, it's not safe to stand on the table and look in the light fixture. That is something about the escape rooms we provide. If you can come at it with an accessibility mindset, it's kind of like a superpower because um, we won't do anything in our escape room or require you do something that uh, isn't able to be done by everybody. And so you can eliminate a lot of things that way. Um, but going back to the sock you brought up, Matt, like that, that physical experience, it was neat when we did the virtual one because we thought about how do you simulate that experience? How do you um, create a, a physical experience in a virtual world that, that still feels like you are exploring um, an escape room in the same way? And so I think that was um, kind of a neat, neat way of having to think about creating, creating the new one or the virtual one. I did love that it was easier to deploy, though, getting it out. And, and so it's easier. Somebody can call us from around the world and we can be like, sure, you can do a virtual escape room. We can do that. It's a lot harder to to get uh, an escape room to Europe, for example. Well, in the um, in the case of, you know, something that that also adds to the the actual experience that we had to deal with in the case of the in-person is because each room may be different. And, and on, you know, we have things on the slide about tactile indicators. We have to give a, um, an, a description of the layout of the room to make it fair play for anybody who's blind as well. And, you know, some of these rooms are very complicated. I remember the first one we did had a large table in the middle of the room. It had um, several couches, things like that. And if you didn't give that ahead of time, then they were... Um, uh, uh, impacted by the layout of the room. And, and that includes where puzzles may exist in the room so that they know where to go um, try out things. Um, when I think of the virtual, and the virtual is where we did put a sock underneath the table, and I give credit to the folks who um, did the, the work because it wasn't in our design. They just did it, which I think was perfect. There's a lot of effort that goes into designing the virtual side because of the accessibility is totally different than the physical um, you know you obviously all the keyboard ac activity the um, uh, descriptions had to be um, done and the descriptions of uh, for example pictures in our original one that was in person we didn't describe the pictures we let people get descriptions from using um, technology such as um, uh, ira or seeing ai to get a description of the picture rather than because it's a physical picture whereas in the virtual one you know we had to uh the the designer of it wrote descriptions for each one of the pictures and so that took a different level of effort than say having um uh, some tool do it for you yeah um one of the things i i also found kind of interesting in both escape rooms and we didn't account for it. it was one of our first lessons learned with doing the escape room was that not only were we providing puzzles but we had to facilitate and design to facilitate um, team building like that was the purpose of it but um, especially the first one we did we had we didn't provide an accommodations overview we didn't provide how to work you know information or a session on how to work with people with different disabilities and so the very first test session we had 
uh, we had an individual who had a disability and they kind of got left behind. It wasn't that they couldn't do the puzzles, it's that we hadn't kind of built up that team building. And we we changed that, but I think in the virtual environment, it has a different, you know, a different tactic to actually facilitating that. Yeah, I, the virtual, um, and it's interesting because this is no different than us having Zoom and Teams and Skype meetings today or whatever, you know, format you may use. Um, we all run into the same problem of how to keep things inclusive, you know, whether it's describing the slides or, or describing the content that you may be on the screen. And does the, you know, one, does the technology give you access to that stuff? But there's times when people don't include people during that discussion. You know, yes, we may have, uh, captions and things of that nature, but it's the other things that may be missing. And so we, even in the virtual one, there was new challenges to team, um, uh, participation and team building that, you know, we may have not um, pushed completely and you know, we let teams do their own thing. But at the end, we bring back, you know, you could have done better as a team, but I, I watched you not describe things that you found in the room. So therefore, some other people who may be um, not part of that, whether they were blind or just not part of that room, that section of the room, didn't get your description it was just like oh wait i unlocked it and that's not enough to give the full participation yeah it reduces some of the fun too um when somebody's like oh you've got the solution but we don't know how you got there so i think that was the, the hardest thing in the virtual is getting people to to really work together um, to have as much fun as possible the um i think back at the the in-person one you know we had such a different um uh, experience depending on the type of team you had mm -hmm. and uh, you know having um, people at least work together on puzzles and that's something that's different in um, some escape rooms that you go to in person there's a puzzle per room to move from room to room um, so it may be three or four rooms that are in a line um, or in a and to get to the next door you have to solve one puzzle or two puzzles and in the, you know, in most of our situations, we've had one room. Um, I would say that when we did it uh, with the second escape room this past summer, one of the things we did, which created more participation as a group, was have two puzzles per room. So everybody worked together to solve those two puzzles. Then when they solved those, they were able to move to the next room. And so we had four rooms that were all in a line. And that allowed us to see a different level of participation and increase the speed that it took or the time that it took people to complete the tasks. Yeah, I think we're still learning a lot about this. And I think it's a it's something we should come back to and probably list out as things to consider when you're doing this kind of escape room. Do you have any other thoughts on this before we move on? No, I think that um, um, it, I, I've liked both styles. Mm -hmm. um, it, I would say that the in-person uh, is fun to watch people um, do certain tasks that you get more hands-on watching them process, um, whereas in the virtual, people are individually working on a task on their mm -hmm. screens, and then they there may be two people doing it, um, but unless you put them in breakout rooms, they, they're still all talking in the same room. So it's a little different way mm -hmm. to accomplish it. Now, my favorite moment in doing all of this is when someone solves a really hard puzzle and the whole team starts jumping up and down in joy. It's, it's a neat moment to watch. Yep. Um, so let's actually talk through an example of how we do this. And I have a couple examples we've talked about before, but the, the first step in this is to figure out what theme you want to do. And we typically come together and have a brainstorming with the full team. We have about six, seven people who work on, on this each time. Um, so what are different kinds of themes we can do? Yeah, and, and I may have you describe these as, as, as images on the screen. Um, there's there's two that I have on the screen that I, I'm well connected to. Is one is, a, is kind of more of a kitchen theme. Um, or, or, you know, uh, uh, I guess it's in, in home theme, but it's around the kitchen and the other would be a sports theme. And if, if let's do the kitchen first, if that's okay. 
um, the other two images on the screen, one is a robot theme, um, and then the last one is a game room theme. Um, game room seems really fun. <laughs> um, it does. But, We've talked about uh, doing that for a while. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's. Uh, you have to. You have to do one play in a game to get moving. Um, but I think the kitchen one's kind of a fun one to do, and everybody knows what a kitchen is, feel comfortable with that. Let's let's jump into that if that's okay. Let's, um, before we do, just to kind of get a sense of what we do, we typically just brainstorm openly, right? Like talking, you'd mentioned a pirate theme earlier and a, and yep. a candy theme, and we've talked, we'll spend about an hour just brainstorming possible themes, but um, but I agree. Let's definitely jump into the kitchen theme and try to try to dig into that. So once we know what a theme is, we kind of tr start brainstorming elements or pieces of a theme. Um, so one, one thing in a kitchen, for example, is recipes. And so there's a lot we can do with recipes. We can, they've got numbers, they've got words, they've, um, they're tactile, you can pick them up. Um, as soon as you get into text though, you've got to start thinking about things like, are we going to do braille? How are people who can't see it going to read it? Um, how are people who can't see it and don't have bra braille skills going to read it? Um, so there's, there's a lot around text, but there's a lot you can do with it too. Yeah. I think you could bring, um, uh, tools to the table as well. Let's, for example, QR codes, um, uh, uh, scanning things with a, a device, um, using an IRA type service. Um, and I think there's different ways to get stuff out of it. What I love about, you know, thinking, thinking of recipes is that, you know, it could then move on to things like looking in the uh, pantry for um, supplies, which could be part of the theme as well and part of the puzzle solving yeah. or even the and refrigerator. <laughs> and while it's not a puzzle, people have a lot of joy in finding things like so placing things in a way that help people find them is often um, a, a fun part of the escape room too. Uh, both, actually our entire team is digital digital accessibility professionals are related to the digital world. So when we did our first escape room, we didn't push as hard as we probably should have into the physical space. Um, and we actually got advice from uh, an expert in designing escape room pieces and, and they pushed us to do more and more physical uh, content. And so when we start thinking about a kitchen, it's great because it's got physical content. So it's got things like drinks or glasses. Um, it's things like baking and all the things that go with it, bowls and pans and pots and, and baking sheets. Um, there's all those appliances we could play with too. So there's a lot of different physical things that could be, be used in a kitchen. I'm probably forgetting some. Well, when I, when I think about the, um, uh, some of the benefits of of using a theme like a kitchen um, then you start taking a puzzle like baking and let's say you want to then associate baking to something that has accessibility related and you can add braille to the theme and this is kind of weird to explain it this way for those who don't know braille but braille is made of six six dots within a cell and so there's three on the left and three on the right and so you could use a six cell, a six cup baking. Uh, um, um, I'm, I'm struggling here with a um, cupcake um, pan as a part of the theme, and attach you know cupcakes to that, which allow you to then you know apply something that relates to Braille to be able to get the puzzle solved, and. It seems weird to think of it that way because obviously Braille is much smaller than a cupcake tin, but it's one way to look at the, the layout of something. And I love that we'd need enough top cupcake tins to make a word, uh, probably to do something with that. And we're going to need plastic cupcakes and glue them in to harden it so that people don't take it apart uh, and glue them in well. Or but that would it. be such a neat way to, to make a tactile and also visual uh, experience. And I, I think I have a picture later on of what that might look like in the slides. but. Um, yeah, another, you can also expand. So this is something that we've had to do during the design process is we kind of run out of ideas if we created a theme that's too small. And so you can think about a kitchen and then start thinking about, okay, well, what about the table? So, or the shopping list, what happens before you get to a kitchen, you write a shopping list or you put that up on a, a refrigerator. Um, 
or you could have a table. And so can we do table settings? And is there something with how you lay out or physically place pieces on a table that we could play with? And so I think one of the things around the themes is as you start talking about and brainstorming the elements, you know, what else can you do to expand or narrow the theme to make it, um, to give you enough variability or enough things that will fit together to make puzzles? So once you start thinking about the, the theme and then the elements and pieces of the theme, then you get to start thinking about the puzzle types. And there's, there's a couple different puzzle types that kind of we could come back to over and over again. Um, locks and lock boxes are huge. Like that's a part of almost of, of many puzzles we do. Um, and I think one of the favorite locks we've had to play with is the directional lock. Yeah, and you know what's weird about this is that I had never seen one before, even being <laughs> blind. I had never seen one before. And I met someone um, yesterday who had one hand. And he could still operate one of these directional locks, which I think is great to see. It does, it, it similar to, um, we're always going to run into some barrier with accessibility um, depending on someone's disability, no matter what we do. I think we're, we're all in, correct me if you don't think I'm right here, Rochelle, but I, I think back at when our, when we first did the escape room, we did something called the easy button mm -hmm. and the easy button didn't have captions, but it had sound. And that was something we were able to solve in the virtual because we could have the easy button on the screen and you pressed it and then we added captions to it yeah. or the designers smartly added caption to it. Should I say, um, this lock works great as long as you have at least one hand if you yeah. don't have either hand um, the question is how would you actually um, use this lock but yes i agree the directional lock um, has been a huge hit for people and it's amazing how many people had never seen one before and went out and ordered one i think we should get some credit from amazon at some point for <laughs> the uh, orders on directional locks after the escape room oh that's funny um Tying to that, so just kind of as an example, if we were doing a brainstorming session, you and I, we would start thinking about the theme here. So if we thought about locks and we maybe going back to the, the recipe, we might say, all right, well, could we get directions into the recipe? Like, um, uh, wait until something rises. Would that tie closely enough to going up on a lock? Um, put things in to the left or to the right of, of the the bowl you're working in to start tying into directions. We might also pull from the recipe uh, things like the numbers that, you know, one cup, five cups, and use a number based lock, a tactile number lock. Um, so those are the kinds of things we would do to tie into a lock uh, is and figure I, out how do you get the, the directions in there? How do you get the numbers in there? I'm actually um, now thinking about this ex exact experience and like planning the next escape room. So we can't yeah. give all of the ideas away. I'm thinking. Oh, I don't think we get to do a kitchen candy. after this, <laughs> <laughs> which is sad because I like the kitchen idea. Um, but you mentioned the physical manipulation, and I think I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to sometimes we can't always accommodate um, every single disability when we're designing. And I think for, especially in the physical, not the virtual, but the physical escape room, one of the big trade-offs is that um, it is a manipulative physical experience. And so we worked really hard in the second one to put voice control into as many puzzles as we could to make and sure captions, it didn't. And captions yeah. along with that, with a keyboard, yeah. on-screen keyboard, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and braille alternatives to any kind of, of um, audio as well as, as um, written alternatives. And yeah, it, but I think that physical manipulation is a problem. So, or a challenge that I don't know that we will ever fully overcome. And, and that really is where that team building comes in. One of our goals has always been that anyone with a disability can do at least a few puzzles. And as long as you have a team that's diverse, everyone can participate in all the puzzles in some way. Um, so I think that's that's been one area that we have to think about. But physical manipulation is huge in escape rooms. So moving things, putting them in a certain order. So going back to that table setting, um, could we have sensors on um, like the knife, the fork, and the plate, and then in the table sense when they are laid out correctly, or the way that some kind of riddle or instruction told people people to lay them out. And uh, I on this slide have something that says. S-E-N-O-R, that's supposed to be sensor, so sensor-based activities. But thinking about how do you um, 
build those into different escape rooms. Maybe you give people, going back to your cupcake example, you give people a letter and they have to put that letter, the cupcake letter, cupcakes into a pan to form a letter. Uh, and when it's correctly made in Braille, then we could trigger something where, you know, whatever the next step is would come and be provided. The sensors have been a real hit and it's something yeah. that, um, until you had gone to an escape room, you didn't think through those kinds of things about how something could trigger something else. And I think in the first one, um, you know, we actually had a, a, it's funny to think about, we had a, like a NASA engineer, right? It was a, um, develop a sensor of some sort. Um, but later we, we discovered that there's, there's actual companies out there who make the sensors so that you can build whatever you want to build. Yeah. And riddles and codes are the other types of uh, puzzles we typically use, and they tie into locks or physical manipulation, telling people what to do uh, once they figure those out. I, I, I could never do the riddle. I'm so happy that we found someone who could write a riddle that last time, because that's, again, this is why you can't do a, a theme to yourself and think you're going to accomplish this. You need a solid team to be able to create this escape room. Because everybody, just like solving the escape room, you need everybody to be able to have their piece that they're an expert at. Um, and that was something I, I would have struggled solving or creating that puzzle. Yeah, she did it. We have a great team. So that's been, been exciting. Team building on our side. Um, I'm just going to read this particular slide. I want to acknowledge that there are different disabilities that hamper participation in traditional escape rooms. Like, and, and we have to try to think about and design for all of these, as well as the in intersections of all of these. And so one of the things in our design process we do is after we create puzzles, we think very carefully about whether we have um, come up with a way for any of any individual uh, to, to do them. And so uh, in kind of the ambulatory space, difficulty gripping, motor impairment, wheelchair use, um, we want to make sure again, this height and reach is there. In the auditory space, deaf and hearing impairments, um, making sure that we have alternatives to any kind of audio, uh, in cognitive and learning, focus and distraction, uh, dyslexia and dyscalculia, and that can really play in when we have codes or riddles. Um, and then also claustrophobia. We want to make sure our themes uh, don't trigger that. Um, from a medical space, you know, chemical sensitivity, we don't get to use a lot of cent centered <laughs> puzzles. Um, fatigue, light sensitivity, so thinking about flashing uh, and, and visual, so individuals who are blind or, or low vision or colorblind. And we want to make sure that we're creating redundancy in everything we're, we're doing to make sure we really cover a lot of these areas. So if we were thinking about one of those puzzles, we would really think through each of these use cases to make sure that we were uh, accounting for as many of them as possible. The one that I think is not listed here that, that we've, I wouldn't say struggled with, but, but it's been um, a different level of effort is deaf blind. And yeah, the intersection. Yeah. The, the challenges we've had around deaf blind is, has been, um, uh, you know, do we get Braille? Is there an interpreter who actually can handle deaf blindness? Um, one of the tools we used um, didn't support connecting a Braille display to it. So if they had read Braille, they weren't able to participate with that one tool. So we had to then go out and have Braille written for what was going to be displayed mm -hmm. on that device, which is fine. It's just something that we weren't as prepared for the first time that we had to resolve at some point. Yeah, that's a great point. So these are two example puzzles and we've talked a little bit about them. Um, on the left side is a recipe and it's just showing that you've got these numbers, these words, these different things. And on the right is that cupcake concept of um, if you have this beautiful six cupcake pan, how many different ways can you play with it? I don't want to talk about this anymore. Um, well, I want a cupcake right now. So yes, let's talk about <laughs> it. Um, I, I, this is the one that I, that, um, there's many ways to take a look at this, whether it's, um, you know, uh, laying things out from a Braille perspective. And if we did this, we would also have to have a clue somewhere in the room that gave input on what Braille 
you know, letters were so that people who didn't know Braille could participate in this activity. And we did that in the first one where we had a Braille card in the room that had the alphabet. And so somebody who could, you know, identify the Braille characters could still participate in it, even if they weren't a Braille reader. As much as we it, we had fun with one clue that, you know, if you were a screen reader user in the virtual, you got more information than if you weren't a screen reader user, which is kind of fun, but it's also mean. Um, so um, there's there are some uh, things that we have to add to the task that, that may not be visually um, on the screen here, like the Braille card, I think was an important one that you have to still throw in the mix. Yeah, I, I really have enjoyed building in this concept of disability as a superpower. And so if you are used to something like Braille, um, it, it, having that is both an educational tool, so teaching people a little bit about it, but at the same time, um, it just speeds up the team if they already have somebody on the team that knows Braille. I think we did something a little similar with captions. So if you were used to captions and getting captions, you would notice a difference faster than if you weren't uh, used to captions. And so just trying to think about how can we how can we not just accommodate but celebrate different disabilities and make that something that's that's more uh, beneficial when you're in our escape room has been something else that I think we've tried to do. So there's some other considerations uh, that we have learned along the way when we've been designing these. And um, one is, is the setup. How we set things up changes the time. Yeah, this one was interesting because we, when we wanted to do this as a corporate experience for a company and we knew that we needed to get people out in a certain amount of time, we definitely had to lay things out where we put... Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. You may have a puzzle that results in unlocking a box. In the beginning, we would put these boxes all around the room. So not only did you find the puzzle, then you had to go find the box that it applied to. That, you know, sometimes took more time. Um, sometimes one group had actually taken all the boxes and put them in one spot so they knew to go play with the boxes after they solved a clue. Um, but by putting them next to each other, um, you were able to do it. I also add by... It, when we did this back in the summer in New Orleans, we, you know, having two puzzles in a room definitely sped things up. I mean, we got our, we got a team down to um, uh, 12 and a half minutes, um, whereas sometimes people were taking up to 30 to uh, 40 minutes when we had them in one room, which sounds completely crazy to think like that, but, but by separating them out, they went much faster. And, and that's the fastest time in that specific escape room. There was one that went all the way to 45 minutes, so there's a slow time as well, but that's sometimes just the team effort or the mix of the team. Yeah, um, definitely the, the closer we put uh, clues and their rele relevant pieces, the faster people figure them out. Um, and then, and I, then that's it is a good is, example on that because in the virtual we didn't we spread it like the the level of effort in the virtual was much more complicated because you would have um, two sets of pictures in two separate parts of the room that applied to each other and um, you know, nobody clued into that it took them a long time for that connection mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that is. Uh, we made it much harder in the virtual um, in that specific case because they, um, we also figured that in virtual you had um, much more ability to click around rather than walk around. So we thought it was going to be, you know, faster, but it was interesting because mm -hmm. people couldn't process things not being near each other. That's a great point. Um, another thing we've learned is that we have to plan on how to handle clues, and especially because if we're running it, different people are are moderating the escape room. Um, we don't want to give things away, so thinking about exactly what piece to give people, and often there's a small phrase um, that you can give someone that creates an aha moment, um, and you want to make sure you're not giving too many to one team to another. And so I think really having written down, you know, here's the list of clues we are going to give based on the situation has been an important part of, of designing the escape room. But it's not something I thought about originally. Yeah, it's it, this is, um, I think, a larger challenge around um, training the people who are supporting the escape room because people want 
to help people solve the puzzles. And yeah. then you find somebody else who's moderating or supporting it who just wants to make it as difficult as possible. And so there has to be some fair play in that, that you have some rules set for the people moderating to support the, the people participating. And internationalization. So we just recently sent one uh, or adapted one to a, a different language, which had a lot of questions for us, things like, is Braille the same in, in, across different languages? Or if, if it not, and how does that affect puzzles? Um, but we also, um, in the kitchen example, kind of going back to that, um, how people lay out tables could be different from culture to culture. And so thinking about those cultural pieces, I think is another uh, interesting challenge as we send this, these escape rooms in different places. And the, the localization was like, um, extremely challenging in this one um, uh, that we you know sent off to Poland, and a lot of it came down to um, in in the uh, the one we had shipped, we normally had written a, a letter that people would read, and that would have not translated the same way in Polish, and so we we actually had to change that entire puzzle to make it work. Um, and so it, it, it worked out great and they had a great time, but it was something that we, um, when we sat back and thought about it, also with the, the amount of time we had to prepare for it, we just chose a different path to create the puzzle that would result in the, the um, unlocking of the box. And so um, that was a lot of fun and they had a great time, but it was definitely something that, that you know, it, it originally, you know, being a English speaker only, I didn't plan in my mind for how to process that change. Yeah, that was a really an interesting learning experience for us. Um, and the other part is really trading the trade-offs that we have to think about for different disabilities. So, you know, how do you support an individual with, with a motor impairment or another ambulatory disability? And by adding voice control, are we making it like harder for someone who is deaf uh, to participate because of the tools we have to use for voice control may or may not support individuals who are deaf as well. Um, I, I think that's another one of the conversations we often have that that really becomes um, both a limiter, limiter and a design challenge for us. Yeah, I think that goes back to the example of if, if you had voice control and that device and, and we had an on-screen keyboard so someone who's deaf could have typed in their the the response for voice control but what we couldn't do is we couldn't apply a braille display so that someone who's deafblind would not be able to participate specifically in that one task and so that goes back to something you said earlier which is you know we're doing everything we can to fit every disability we can we're going to miss something but we also learned from people who did it um, who gave us some ideas about how to resolve this in the future yeah. And and when the things can't go, you know, when we can't do any more, we'll try to provide accommodations that have planned for them. But it's it's definitely a constant learning experience. I mean, the other one that really I think we we played with was we had a visual um, sound, a beeping, and a I'm sorry, a sound which was beeping and a visual flash to match the beep, and and trying to make sure we covered both the visual and audio and also avoided triggering seizures. Like that was a, a space that we had to work really carefully on to make sure we had, had done right. And that's, that's kind of interesting when you talk about that, because you know, a lot of times when we think about flashing, we always talk about it from a, a digital accessibility point of view and not a physical point of view, but we applied the digital accessibility to the physical in that case of the flashing to meet that requirement. Um, and, and, I would say that when we're thinking about the, the physical ones, you know, we start with the physical because that's the, the easy play, but then we start thinking about how would we turn that into a, uh, in a, um, uh, virtual one. And it's a lot of fun to think about how someone's going to be creative in their design and development efforts. And with that, I think we are open for questions. Thank you for such a illuminating talk. Uh, that's learned a lot. And uh, yeah, Mark, 
do you do you know of any questions that have come across our uh, our way? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, like wow, um, I, I this is mind blowing because I, I organize events and conferences and stuff, but um, organizing this, I mean, that's a completely different level. <laughs> honestly, uh, it's just fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have one question actually that is. Um, being asked in the YouTube chat um, from uh, Makoto Ueki. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, and the question is, can we experience the escape rooms at CSUN next year or any other conferences? Uh, his colleague, he says, uh, also got interested uh, in the escape rooms, but uh, he doesn't speak English. Can he enjoy it there as well? So, um, Yes, we'll plan to have them at C CSUN next year um, in uh, Anaheim. I'm not sure if we'll have two or one. Um, then in terms of participating, we may need, you know, he may need to bring an interpreter or somebody else who can um, interpret for him because everything's written in English at, uh, well, we could probably bring Polish right now, but <laughs> just because we've already done that. But um yeah, we've not gone down total internet um, localization of all of the um, puzzles within uh, both escape rooms at this point. But if um, if you plan to come, bring someone who does speak English if you do not, and actually by forming that team and having that, that conversation, it actually becomes more of a team building activity as long as one person can interact. And there are still many things that can be done. So we talked about riddles and codes and clues. Those are going to be written in English, but then the actual how do you solve the puzzle is, is not language dependent once you have that translation. And so there's lots of ways to still, still participate and have fun, um, even if, if you're not a native English speaker. And in the in the case of what we did for for Poland, uh, Rochelle, um, you know everything we've done, we now have an idea of how to map it for another language. Doesn't mean we're experts in that language. And so, if somebody wants to help, you know, convert for a language, we're willing to chat about it as well. Absolutely, we do need, need the language expert yeah. to do it. Yeah, great. Yeah, well, while we talk about help, actually, that's another question from Kyle, uh, who's asking, are you doing advocacy uh, work on uh, to encourage and help other escape room companies to create and upgrade rooms to being more accessible? So we've kind of started that down that road, but we haven't really launched some of the plans we have. We do want to do that. Um, and we do have those conversations occasionally, but we haven't done a strategic effort yet. It is something we were talking about for next year, but we're not quite there. Though we are happy to talk with any escape room who would like to talk with us to help. And sometimes you have to go to your escape room and ask them, you know, and, and you know, in my town alone, we can probably have five or six within, you know, five, 10 miles from us that are, you know, running these escape rooms. They're just common popular things to do. Um, and if it, we didn't mention this at the beginning, but you know, it originally came to us to do the accessible escape room from Rochelle and I having lunch after I had been with my daughter to an escape room with her friends and I couldn't participate as a blind person. So that's why we got into kind of uh, uh, creating this from the very beginning was is just that experience of being disabled and going to one and not being able to participate. Oh, great. I mean, uh, again, uh... Uh, I, I'm fascinated by the topic. Actually, it's uh, it's, it's great. I could ch chat on forever, uh, but sadly, we are already running out of time. Uh, we only have an hour to get to the next session on the on the full hour at eleven o'clock my time. Uh, so therefore, um, I'd say we wrap up here. But I think uh, you can uh, meet and chat to uh, Rachel and Matt um, on Twitter. You can find the handles on uh, on our website um, to ask questions on Twitter, and I'm pretty sure they they're gonna uh, happily answer those questions. Um, and with that, I say thank you once more for watching um, and pass over to Eric. Yeah, thank you. Um, just wanted to echo what a just really interesting and engaging talk. Um, I just, I really loved, you know, intersectional identity and how that gets turned into fun. Um, so just a really refreshing uh, kind of a kind of talk. Um, if you enjoyed this talk and you're watching it on YouTube, um, you can use that like button to show your appreciation, uh, and you can also use the subscribe button to receive updates when uh, new talks go up on our YouTube account. Also, a reminder that Inclusive Design 24 is a welcoming community. 
You can find a link to our code of conduct on the footer of every page of our website, uh, inclusivedesign24.org. Inclusive Design is also brought to you by Fable, Entopia, Barrier Break, TPGI, UX for the Win, Equal Entry, Infoaxia, Intuit, the Law Office of Laney Feingold, Adrian Roselli LLC, and WebAble. Uh, thanks to their generosity, we're able to bring this conference to you for free. So uh, just thank you again for all their generosity and support. And we will be back on the hour with our next session. And thank you again to Rochelle and Matt. And thank you to Mark for being an excellent co-host.